Hey there, it's Mario Tomic here and I just got a bunch of awesome questions that I wanted to answer here on this video because I think you're going to find a lot of value in this on your journey of self-improvement, to bettering yourself, whether it's in fitness, where you want to transform your body right now, get leaner, build more muscle, or you want to improve your business, your career, whatever area of your life you want to work on, I think you're going to find value in this. And the first question actually that stood out here for me was, what was the wake-up call for you? And I actually had multiple wake-up calls in my life. One was to handle my health, then another one was to get better at social skills, and a third one was to get better at business. So I sucked at all three of those, and it took me a long time to actually figure these things out. And they went in order, first my health, then I worked on my social skills, then I actually started my business, which you might know me more for because I started YouTube and then eventually built the brand and you, most people know me by that. Now, back in the day when I first started out, before the business was just even an idea, I started my fitness transformation. That was my first wake up call. So I came out of college, I was just graduating, I was very overweight, then I went to be skinny fat, and I was working as a developer and a system admin. I just started a job, and it was just my first job, and I was so thrilled about that. I thought it was a huge turning point in my life, which wasn't really a big turning point when eventually I found out. And in that moment, I actually realized my health was really bad. And I was coming up from a lot of bad habits that I built up in college. I was playing World of Warcraft. I was doing really all the things that you don't want to do for your health. I wasn't exercising. I was eating bad food most of the day. I wasn't really paying attention. My level of awareness for my nutrition and just that connection between nutrition and your energy levels and your health, I just didn't think about any of that. I was just going with the flow. Like most people in their early 20s, you don't really think about your health unless you've really had a wake-up call at some point. And that was the wake-up call for me. I was 23, I was like, okay, I gotta do something about this. And I started going to the gym when I realized that, look, I'm skinny fat, I need to do something about it because I don't feel like strong, like a 23-year-old. I feel like I'm always tired, I'm not very focused. I just have the energy. I would walk up the stairs. I would get super sweaty. It was just really bad. And I decided to actually invest in health and fitness. And the way I did that first was I just didn't know what to do. So I asked one of my buddies who was a World of Warcraft player to help me out, to recommend me a program. And he just crafted some random program for me. And then I got to the gym. Now, the really big thing for me, like the wake-up call, was that I just realized the connection between how you can actually improve yourself through nutrition and through training, I just realized that the stuff that I was doing in games were characters because I was leveling up characters in World of Warcraft. Before that, I was playing Unreal Tournament. I was playing all kinds of games and on a really high level and some even professionally. And actually, I realized that, look, I'm a character and I'm not taking care of my own character that well. And that was a big wake-up call for me when I realized the connection between your health and what you put in your body and how you exercise. And I realized that good nutrition and exercise are actually needs for your body and that you need to do them if you want to perform at your best. And then I realized like these are key ingredients. If I want to make it in life, I want to be successful, I got to do this. I got to get myself in good shape and I got to challenge myself with something. So that was really the first thing that I challenged myself with truly because it was so outside of my comfort zone. I never lifted. I mean, I was never really that much into weight training. Actually, when someone would mention that they lift weights, I would just always kind of say something about you know bodybuilders they're not very inspiring why would you want to look like that big guy i was always thinking that people do it for an ego boost or whatever the stereotype was at the time and that took a lot of shattering in my beliefs when i got into that because i realized that there's a lot of guys that lift weights that are not like super huge and on steroids and things like that and i realized that there's just like really cool dudes lifting weights challenging themselves improving themselves eating right and bettering themselves. And I think that's for me really that turning point as far as health and fitness. But then I had another turning point when I was in my job. A year later of my job, I realized, man, like I don't want to keep doing this for the rest of my life. I didn't see myself as a software developer, system admin. I just didn't like it. And I studied five years computer science and I just did it because it was like the nice first job. I waited six months to a year to actually get it because it was a massive hassle to get my first job. I mean, that was back in like during the crisis times. And um, that was a really tough thing to realize, that you realize that I'm on a path that you see other people in the office and yeah, I don't really see myself doing this because I, I noticed that it's not going anywhere. I wasn't improving as fast and there was just a lot of things that weren't really something that I saw myself do in the future because I kind of analyzed, well, these people have been here for a decade or 
15 years and they're not really that happy. Like what they're doing, I wouldn't want to do right now, even if I had that chance. So I made a complete switch for my job. I actually quit that job, which is a garment job. And I started learning marketing on the sides that I started interning for multiple companies. Eventually become um, a marketing consultant and a, and a marketing director in one of the companies eventually after years and years. And then I transitioned to my business, building my fitness business, which happened over a course of years and years and years. So there's a lot of wake up calls in there. And for building my business was a wake up call for starting my YouTube channel was a wake up call because I realized that if I'm going to live and I have to have some purpose. I realized that this is the area where I want to dedicate myself to helping people. And that was a big wake up call for me because then I had to burn the bridges with my job, with my marketing and all that other stuff. And I had to quit that job and quit on other stuff that I had and really hyper commit to fitness. And that's something that once you burn those boats, you go all in. That's when really the magic happens in life. So I think if you're currently kind of not sure what to do, you really got to uh, firstly, okay, what do I really love to do? What am I good at? And what can I help the world with? And then you start from there and you start crafting, okay, what could be my purpose? And you start getting on that journey of exploration. And I had a couple of options that I thought that I was really good at. I was really good at marketing. I was really good at social media stuff, but then I was also really good at fitness and nutrition. That was kind of my passion, you know, kind of just realizing that the body is like a machine where you have this input and you have this output and you can make these changes and you can be in control of this. So it's not some kind of vague woo-woo thing. It's really something you can be in control. And that was the turning point for me when I decided, okay, I'm going to commit to my business. And there's a couple of other turning points in relationships and social skills. Like when I got to learn about RSD and uh, going out and learning social skills, like opening my mind to thinking outside of the box and just all this dating stuff. I mean, there's so much stuff that you have to go through if you're looking to level yourself up as a person in this life. There's so many amazing things and epiphanies that you will realize on the way to the journey. And so there's multiple wake-up calls in there. And I think that I will have more wake-up calls in the future. I think wake-up calls don't really stop at some age. There's always wake-up calls as you keep growing as a person, as you keep advancing, and as you go through life, through different phases, you're supposed to have wake-up calls where things just reorganize in your mind. So your priorities change. And for a lot of people, a wake-up call might be something that is really bad, like um, let's say getting sick or losing their job or their business falls apart or they get a breakup, you know, a really nasty breakup or a divorce or something like that. You don't have to wait for that. So don't wait for a nasty wake-up call. Be proactive. If there's one thing that I should have done is like just be a little bit more proactive and not be so closed off before I got into health and fitness. When I got into health at age of 23 afterwards, I was really open-minded because when I got into health, it shattered a lot of the beliefs that I used to have. And I realized that the secret is actually not to hold on to beliefs as much and to be willing to change your beliefs about a thing and really give it a try. Instead, of kind of dabbling around it and just believing in all these stereotypes and all, the, all this nonsense without even trying or taking any action. So that's one of the things I think is my core value now that I'm really most proud of is the ability to, when new data comes in, when new information comes in, just be willing to give up beliefs and change yourself. So no matter what happens, we all will make mistakes. We all will you know, mess up at some point. But if you're willing to own that and give up your belief and what you think is true now in course of new data, if it proves otherwise, I think you're going to win and you're in a really, really good path in life if you do that. Um, a couple other questions, actually some really cool stuff here. Uh, what's your favorite book on building habits? Uh, I like the recent book that just came out. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend it. And I'm actually going to link my top 10 books as well here because a lot of people ask, what do you read? I read a lot. I read about one to three books per week. So I'm going to link my top 10 here that I just put together because a lot of people have been asking me what's the top 10. It's not really a top 10. That, I mean, they could make 100 other books in this top 10, but I just wanted to put something together because you can't go wrong with any of the top 10 and also with Atomic Habits. It's an amazing book. James Clear is a super cool dude. I love his writing. So I think you're going to find that a ton of value in that book and you can apply it to any area of your life because habits are so universally applicable that anything in your life that you're looking to improve and you're struggling with being consistent, I think Atomic Habits will definitely uh, help you out. Uh, a couple other questions here is, um, 
let me see, just scroll down. How do I stay motivated? Okay, so look, the secret to motivation is to not depend on motivation. And I'm gonna explain what that means. I don't stay motivated. So there's days when I wake up that I'm not motivated. I'm legit not fond of going to the gym. Like I just don't want, but I still do it because it's my passion. It's something that's a habit in my life. It's something that happens automatically without the need of motivation or feeling inspired. Just that, you know, reading a quote or watching a video that amps you up. You don't need that. What you need to do is muster up either discipline to make it a habit eventually, or it has to be something that becomes eventually a part of your identity, which is through a repetition over time, over time becomes a part of your core values. Now, I would probably need motivation not to go to the gym because I have so much momentum and it's a part of who I am. My being, my core value is to work on my health and fitness. My core value is to give my body what it really needs, and that's exercise, that's good food, that's rest and recovery. I know that my body needs that, I have one body, unless you know some way to you know, teleport my consciousness into something else and just get another body. Like we have one and we have to treat it well. We're going to be on this planet for a very long time, like relatively speaking to other humans. I mean, in the course of a universe, it's like a blip, it's nothing, but it's a pretty decent life. Span, if you treat your body right, you can really make a difference in the world. So I want to treat that body right. And that's a part of my core values, my principles, my life philosophy involves me taking care of myself. So I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up no matter what, whether I'm motivated, whether I'm not motivated, whether it's raining outside, whether it's snowing outside, it's like super cold, super warm. It doesn't matter. I will just show up regardless of how I feel. And this is not just for health and fitness. This is how you got to show up in any area of your life that you want to improve. You can't look at the emotional state as a guiding factor when it comes to making that decision. The emotional state will fluctuate. As an entrepreneur, one of the first things you realize is just the roller coaster. It's like crazy. Like it's insane. I know the roller coaster of business is it's ridiculous, especially if you're just starting out. If it's your first year in a business, like one week goes well, next week, a bunch of haters come at you. Then the next week, something else happens. Then fourth week, you know, something gets shut down and then you're hurting. And there's so many things like you mess something up and it's hard to recover from that. So that roller coaster is something that a lot of entrepreneurs get affected by. And that's why they can't run a proper successful business because they're very emotional. They're so attached to that emotion as a driver and as a motivator to actually do stuff that they're so inconsistent. And one of the key factors in business success, in any success, is consistency. So if your emotional state is the primary thing that you're looking for to be consistent, you're not gonna make it. It has to be detached from the emotion and also relatively detached from the outcome to some extent. I think some attachment to the outcome is good just for goal planning and goal setting and just being sure that you're actually gonna hustle and work hard for it. But also you gotta be detached from external circumstances that are outside of your control. This is actually part of my life philosophy. I read a lot of stoicism. Stoicism is really big on this. There's external circumstances in your life you have no control over. And, but you have control over your attitude toward those circumstances. So if something happens that you just couldn't foresee, something that's really bad for your business or something that's really bad for your body, like you just couldn't figure it out, like you get a flu, stomach flu of some sorts. Well, you can't really change that. I mean, you can learn from it. Maybe you can avoid the restaurant or the place you went to eat there to get where you got that bug. But what you can change actually is your attitude toward the whole situation. You can own the situation. You can try to make the best out of it. And maybe you can't go to the gym, but now you say, well, look, I then have four or five extra hours per week. Maybe I can spend those four or five extra hours on reading. Maybe I can listen to some inspiring stuff to prepare myself for when I get healthy to get back in there and crush it. So I think people rely on motivation too much and they don't look at things like discipline and habits and identity and their core values enough because motivation is very, very attractive. You know, it kind of comes and goes. There's these waves that it's so unpredictable and it's almost the way you procrastinate if you just wait on that motivation wave to come. Because sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't. So it's really like a clever excuse that people make for why they are not successful is that I'm not motivated. It's like one of the old ones. I don't have enough time. 
everybody has enough time. Come on, we have 168 hours a week. Everybody has the same amount of time. There's people that are billionaires. They're they're rocking the world. They're changing the world. There's people that are, and I'm just saying financial here because that's an easy way to, for some people to understand that there's super successful people doing it. Not to say that finance is all the most important thing in the world, but look, everybody like Elon Musk has same amount of hours and he's gonna go to Mars, right? Like you got to learn how to use your time better. And all those excuses go out the window when you find dozens and hundreds of examples of people that do it better than you and just do it more efficiently and they're crushing it. Now that doesn't leave you any excuses. So I think the need for motivation is also often used as an excuse to not take massive action and to not do the right thing. And I don't stay motivated, but I do the right thing anyway. So that's the answer to that question. Couple other questions is, do I have a morning routine? Uh, stretching, meditation, stuff like that. Actually, I do have a morning routine and my morning routine is very simple. I'm a big fan of essentialism, of simplicity. One of my first things that I do in the morning is drink water. I also weigh myself every day as a nice habit to kind of keep my weight in check. I expose myself to bright light. I like to go outside into the sun, which is really an awesome way to ground your circadian rhythm. That's a part of my morning routine. I'm gonna also uh, review like things that I've planned the day before. And if it's a workout day, I might hit the gym. If it's not a workout day, I'm gonna start working on the first thing that day that I have planned. And I usually plan my days the night before. That's what I like to do. It's like planning the night before gives your subconscious some time to work on the problem while you're sleeping. So when you wake up, you always get a few extra ideas for how to tackle that first thing. I try to keep the morning routine super simple, throw in a cold shower there, and I just keep it very, very simple because I, I see a lot of people that have these 40-step morning routines and it just turns into this huge ritual that takes a, and a half the day to complete and you don't even know it's your morning routine or not anymore. I try to keep things very simple. I didn't think a morning routine should be include more like four or five things at most and they should be able to stack together instead of doing a lot of bunch stuff that is just taking too much time. So focus on getting stuff done, uh, measure the output, and don't just do a routine for the sake of a routine. Make sure that the routine is actually contributing to something so that there's some point of, to that routine. Uh, let me check. <laughs> uh, what is a good body for percentage to hold on over the whole year. So what I found with clients, most guys are really happy to be between like 10 and I would say 13% body fat throughout the year with minor fluctuations. And I think that's a really awesome body fat percentage to be at because you're not super low to a point where it's starting to affect your mood and your hunger. It's really it's hard to maintain for a lot of people. And it's not too high because you still see your abs, you still see your six pack. And if you wanna be lean all year round, that's really a point between 10 and 15% where you can be relatively lean, you can be ready for a photo shoot if you wanna do that or ready for the beach in just a week or two. Other than that, you can all just be happy and keep training and improving yourself. And I think that's a reasonable level for most people because you're not getting too fat, but you're also not getting too skinny. So you're kind of in between, which is perfect. And um, when I say too skinny, for a lot of people that don't have a bunch of muscle mass, you gotta work on also lean gaining. So that gives you basically enough room to actually lean gain and then stay relatively lean because you get up to 15%, you can do a bit of a cut, then you can get back up there and you can kind of eventually net increase your lean body mass, which is really important so you don't end up being skinny. So that's a really cool thing. Uh, let me check in. I'm gonna answer a couple more questions here. <laughs> Someone is asking about the beard. Uh, I think it's pure genetics, nothing. <laughs> I can't comment on that. Uh, how long do you rest in your one hour workouts? So I typically rest about two to three minutes between my sets, sometimes a bit less if it's an exercise that doesn't require a lot of rest, if it's a lateral raise or something for my arms, if I'm doing like pump sets, high reps, I'm gonna rest about a minute. Uh, but for the most part, between two and three minutes, I try to keep it like that and I try to time it so it doesn't get out of hand. Because sometimes you, if you don't time it, it easily, you can keep you undercutting, which can sacrifice your training quality and your performance and your volume. If you do too much rest, now the workout's too long, so you end up having to cut an exercise out and no, you can't finish the whole thing in time. Um, so let me check here. How many days a week do you train? So this actually varies. So my training program adapts to my lifestyle, and this is the same thing I do with my clients. We wanna make sure that you do the most sustainable amount 
of training that you can sustain. So in some cases for me, that could be six days a week. I can be comfortable with training six days a week. Now, on other cases, I may tone that down all the way to three sessions per week or maybe four sessions per week. I love training. So for me, I don't give up those training sessions lightly. I want to keep training because it makes me feel great. And I like shorter workouts more frequently rather than super long workouts three to four times a week. So I prefer to go more frequently. But in some cases, if I'm going through certain phases of my business that I got to really focus a lot on producing uh, like my backend material that I work with my clients, a lot of client delivery work and customizations. So then in those cases, I might go down to five, four, or even three days a week for some periods of time. So it can vary. There is no one set amount of days that I go and that everything else is just nonsense. So I vary that quite a lot. Is cutting or bulking more difficult? Actually, it would depend on you. Like some people find that cuts are not as hard as gaining because they're just naturally that well adapted to eating less and just get cut easier. Gaining can be super hard for some people if you're, again, that naturally skinny guy who doesn't have the appetite to gain. So I I don't think either one is more difficult. I think they're equally difficult. Now for most people, probably due to lifestyle reasons, uh, I would say if you equate everything, cutting is probably gonna be more difficult for a lot of people because they just don't have a good system because the way they approach cutting is super restrictive. So it turns into this huge yo-yo dieting scheme where you roller coaster weight all the time and it just becomes unsustainable. So that's, I think, why cutting for a lot of people is, is much harder. But in fact, if you look at like what is really hard, it's gaining muscle, right? That's really the hard part about training because you gotta keep challenging your body and that's the harder part than losing fat. Talk to any advanced lifter, Losing fat is not that hard. Getting super lean is not hard. But building more muscle gets progressively harder the closer to your genetic potential. So it can go both ways depending who you speak to. Like if someone has to lose like 50, 60 pounds, probably going to say that the weight loss is a bigger problem. But in fact, the hidden problem is building more muscle because that is actually going to get much harder over time. While fat loss tends to get easier over time, the more you know about your body, your nutrition, and, your li- and how to adapt the whole thing to your lifestyle. So it can go both ways. You can see that the answer is a bit more nuanced. And um, I'm going to take one more question. Uh, what book are you reading into at the moment? So right now I'm actually reading a book called Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport, which is a book about uh, managing your social media time and how connected you are. I find this book very interesting because it comes at a time that we're all so addicted to our phones. Like, I mean, we unlock this phone like four or 500 times a day, which is crazy. And I sometimes just go on the streets to when I walk and I just observe and as I'm listening to my audiobook, I'm also multitasking. But I just kind of look around, especially started reading this book. I started to look around like how many people are checking their phones like within like 10, 20 seconds. It's crazy. Everybody is on their phones all the time. In restaurants, most people are checking their phones. They're not even paying attention to the people they're having food with. In the gym, everybody's on their phone all the time. And this digital minimalism It's a movement to basically give yourself some time where you're not connected and give yourself some solitude even. And I think solitude is highly underrated. Just spending some time with your own thoughts without having other thoughts come into your mind. Think about that for a second because we're consistently connected and I can tell this from personal experience. I'm always either audiobook when I'm walking, when I'm home, I'm either teaching or I'm learning and consistently there's this flow of information and I would be- definitely benefit from detaching myself completely and I try to do that throughout the day. I try not to check my phone the first few hours, but it's not enough. You may even benefit from a full week or even a month of complete social media detox, which is a very interesting idea. I'm kind of thinking about that. I'll see if that is feasible for my business and to stay touching clients. I I do need to stay connected, but I might find a way to hack around it. And uh, Digital Minimum is very, very cool. Like I love Cal Newport stuff. I think his book, Deep Work, is amazing. This is kind of a sequel to that. It goes into similar ideas, but more of tackling the most common distraction nowadays, which is the phone and social media. So if you're currently looking for a new read, I would highly recommend checking out Digital Minimalism. I think you're gonna love it. 
it's an amazing book so far for me. I think I'm uh, halfway through the book. Uh, a lot of interesting stories, anecdotes, and um, applicable advice. And it's more of like a wake-up call and to become aware of these things. Because who is really aware of it? Like most people are not thinking about how much time they're spending on their phone. And for us, we're actually, I mean, I'm a millennial. So for me, the amount of time I'm spending on my phone I mean, I didn't grow up with a phone. I just didn't have it. I mean, I got a Nokia 3310 at some point, but we didn't have smartphones when we were growing up. Now, the real question is, what's going to happen to people that are being born right now? And they're going to be connected from day one. As soon as they become conscious, immediately plugged into the system. So they might have a more beneficial time actually from detoxing from social media or managing it more and more. So we don't really know what's going to happen, which is very interesting. This symbiosis that we have with technology, it's like, this phone is, is basically like an extra organ that you have and your laptop is another one. So it's, you're kind of a cyborg uh, where you're operating and you have these extra limbs and tools that you can connect and uh, talk to other people, which is really cool as an idea. But we don't really know what are all the negatives and positives of this. So that's why reading stuff like digital minimalism, which almost challenges the current norm and the current way of thinking is very beneficial. I think people that often use social media or people that are influencers or spending a lot of time on social media would highly benefit from reading this book. And uh, as I said, going through it right now, I will uh, review on Goodreads as usually I plug a little bit of a review there when I uh, mark the book as read, which is also beneficial for some people that follow me on Goodreads uh, because I read a ton, so there's a bunch of stuff already on there. Uh, other than that, that's actually the last question that I wanted to answer here in this video. I hope you find this uh, helpful and valuable. I just wanted to kind of blast through all these questions here and share some of my thoughts because I thought the questions were really cool. There's a bunch of other ones. Um, if you haven't been following me on Instagram, definitely do that. You know, Check out my Instagram, Mario Tomic uh, with an H. Uh, T-O-M-I-C-H at the end and the way my name is actually pronounced and uh, check out that I do ask a lot of questions there then I answer them in stories so you may find that super valuable other than that thanks for watching and I will uh, see you in the next video